welcome back or if you're new here thanks for watching i'm tamara i love to knit and this video is just going to be like a chill cozy knitting hangout um i asked some questions on my instagram i just hit 20,000 subscribers on there which was crazy it warms my heart i feel like the knitting community is just such an incredible place so um i feel very humbled that there's people who like want to follow along with my projects so i asked in my stories if there are any questions that people had for me or like things they wanted me to talk about or want to know about my life so i'm gonna go through those questions and I'll try to go as fast as i can and i'm wearing my prima pullover um sweater very rainy and cold this week so um i'm taking the opportunity to wear it again before it is too warm um and i'm working on Sorry that everything I'm knitting is like black right now, but this one is a new top that I'm designing and I'm working on the upper back. You can see there's some little eyelet holes. What will this be? I don't know. Stay tuned to my channel to find out, I guess. So let's go through some questions. So someone asked, how many patterns are you planning on releasing this year? Um, that's a good question. So if you saw my knitting goals video, I had said that I wanted to release five patterns this year. I so far have released three, although one of them was kind of a carryover from the previous year of my cherry bomb crop, and then I released two accessory patterns. Um, I have two patterns that are in testing right now. One is the Thine Own Top, and one is the Prep School Pullover. So I guess that's another two. And then I have one that's in tech editing right now, and I have, I don't even know, probably like four tank tops <laughs> that I've designed that I have not like found testers for yet that are somewhere in in the midst of either like I need to finish grading them or I need to finish formatting it or I need to get a tech editor. Um, oh, and then I also have this one. I don't know, if you were counting, tell me how many that is. <laughs> so it feels like kind of a lot. Um, this has definitely been a very like creatively inspired year so far. And I'm still kind of catching up with some of the things that I designed last year that I wanted to make patterns for. Do you have any pets and have you ever knitted anything for them? That is such a cute question. I love this one asset and it feels absolutely tragic to say, no, I don't have any pets and I have never knitted anything for an animal. Um, I guess, except for human animals because aren't we all just animals in the end? Um, but no, I've never done anything for a pet. Um, I wish that I had a pet. I wish I could get a cat. I had a cat growing up that I loved. He was a black cat named Sammy. But unfortunately, I started to develop some cat allergies as an adult, which was really sad. I like stayed with a friend who had a cat and I kept thinking that my something was wrong with my mascara, but no, it turns out um, cats make my eyes really itchy now. So that is a major bummer. But I did have a dream last year that I found a stray cat on the street and it wasn't wearing a tag, but somehow in like the dream logic way, I just knew that his name was Bistro. But I feel like the universe was literally telling me to get a cat and name it Bistro. Um, and I'm all about listening to what your dreams tell you, I guess. I don't know. I love dreams. I love hearing about other people's dreams. Um, and... I really like the idea of like having a pet that I named completely based off of a dream. Um, I also had a dream once that I went to an incredible bar that had like karaoke and a dance floor and all these crazy cocktails and it was called Beer Baby Bar. And so that is also another dream that I have in life is to open up a bar one day named Beer Baby Bar and to have a cat named Bistro. So you guys are really already learning a lot about me in this video. Um, next question, how to price hand knit items? Girl, you tell me, I don't know this actually. Um, so I haven't sold any hand knits that I've made. I'm realizing, yeah, I've never sold a single thing. I've only even given away like maybe two, three gifts total. I am a selfish knitter, as I say. I feel like I'm just always knitting things that I wanna wear. And so then I like can't <laughs> part with them because I would feel, I guess, irrational jealousy at seeing someone else wear the thing that I wanted in my wardrobe. Um, and I don't often knit things multiple times. Um, I guess I have with a couple of samples, but I've always ended up choosing a variety of yarns so that it doesn't feel like it's the exact same thing in my wardrobe twice. So that is kind of a barrier. Um, but yeah, I guess part of it for me is for not selling things is I feel like a lot of the stuff that I make is kind of class, like not classic, but like I feel like it looks like you could buy it at a store. So I'm kind of like, I don't know what my pricing would be that would make it worth it for someone to buy it and like worth it for me to spend the time knitting it to sell it if it's something that you could just go buy at a store. So I don't know. I, I think maybe for some of my more special pieces, I could think about selling them. Um, I'm actually thinking about selling this um, like corset accent tank top that I've been working on because I'm a little sensitive to that yarn. So I don't think I'll get much use out of it. But yeah, okay, so you tell me what you think I should price it at because I really don't know. Like, obviously you wanna make the cost of yarn back and then you want to pay for your own time a little bit, especially if it's like a source of income for you and not just like, you know, trying to make back yarn costs to perpetuate 
your hobby. So I don't know. I think that it can get a little bit tricky when you see like, oh, charge an hourly wage, but then it's like, okay, a beginner would take a lot longer to make something than someone experienced. But I guess if a beginner is paying themselves a really low minimum wage or like hourly wage and a, an expert is like giving themselves a higher one, I don't know. Also, I'm realizing this might not be the best project to work on because it's like black yarn. It's um, knitting for olive silk, which is nice. It's not as silky as the other silk that I've used, which was Knit Picks Luminous, but um, it keeps splitting. So I guess we'll see how much I can actually look up while knitting this. I feel like thin needles, this is actually the smallest needle size I've ever used on a project. It's my size two needles, which are the smallest needles in my interchangeable kits because I don't really knit socks. So I don't really have smaller ones than this. So we'll see how it goes. Um, okay, next question. What is your process to design your knits? So I'm planning on sharing a design with me vlog that will hopefully like give more information about this. But um, I would say the general process is you start with some inspiration that you have. So that can come from anywhere. It can come from other clothes you've seen. It could come from just an idea in your head. Um, so definitely kind of like keep your eye open for inspiration in the world. I'm always like taking screenshots of things. If something made me think about knitting for more than like a half second, I take a screenshot of it or I save it on Pinterest because that could be fruitful. Um, and then I, so after I get the inspiration, sometimes I'll do a little sketch if I like feel like I need to visualize different things. Um, and then I will do some swatching. So sometimes I know what yarn I wanna use ahead of time and that like is kind of what inspired it. And sometimes I'm not sure what yarn I wanna use or I'm not sure what the drape of the yarn will be, etc. So I'll do some swatching and then I will, now I try to force myself to do some grading before I knit up my sample. Um, and that's because I don't really like grading that much. And I also don't like delaying gratification. So I have to like force myself to do the less fun part before I do the fun part. Otherwise I do the fun part, which is actually knitting the thing. And then I'm like, yay, I'm done. And I kind of try to take notes as I'm knitting it. Like sometimes I'll change things from my original idea. And um, trust me, you want to take a notes because sometimes you think you're doing it and you are actually not <laughs> at all. And um, that can be really frustrating when you're like trying to decipher your knitting after the fact. And you're like, how many rows is this? What technique did I use? Like, what what was this? Um, I've also like looked back at some of my notes before I've been like, this is cryptography basically. Like this is like an encoded state secret. Like, why did I write it this way? I cannot possibly understand what this was supposed to mean. So yeah, do your future self a favor and take a notes while you are working on your design. Okay. So someone said, how are you such a productive designer? Any tips for organizing or making time? That is so nice that I give off the appearance of being organized and productive because I feel like my lived experience is one of absolute chaos. But, um, in terms of what was it? Staying organized or organizing. So I actually made myself a little spreadsheet with patterns that I want to release. And the reason that I did this was I feel like <clears throat> I'm always like driven to knit. And so I'm often just like very excited about the next thing that I can knit. And that's partly, you know, the creative energy. I want to like see things come into being. And also I'm like a basically like chronic fidgeter. And so I use knitting as my like fidget stim, I guess. Um, so I always want to be knitting. So I feel like that would make me kind of like forget other things I would need to do to work on a pattern besides just actually knitting the thing. So I made this spreadsheet. I actually showed it on my Instagram story once and all these people messaged me, like probably at least five people messaged me being like, wow, what software is this? Like it's a Google doc. Yeah. Or a Google sheet. Um, I am not fancy. I use Google workspace tools for basically all of my like knitting stuff and also add drop downs. So I think that was what everyone was impressed by these like color coded drop downs, but that's really nice. Cause it kind of helps me visualize like where are all these projects at? And then I ordered them based off of what I would hope the launch sequence would be because some things like, a, you know, a sweater, you probably don't need to launch in the middle of summer. You could launch that in the fall. That's why um, this sweater I've kind of been putting on the back burner for a little bit. Um, so yeah, I find that really helpful. And I also like, I do all of my grading in Google Sheets and I do my pattern editing in Google Docs, which like maybe one day I will make a template that is like much prettier. Um, I did my first pattern in Canva and I just found it like such a pain whenever I needed to add or remove things. I had to like reformat the whole thing. So I've just been doing Google Docs. I think it's great for, um, 
like sharing the pattern with testers because then you can update it as feedback comes in and all the other testers benefit from that feedback immediately. And that also means that I can just link straight from the spreadsheet to the actual pattern. So I find that really useful. I think that um, I have a pretty hard time sometimes like prioritizing or staying on task. And so I like to look at this to kind of remind me like, what should I be working on next? Um, for instance, like yesterday, I had a new idea for, like I'm already working on this new project. I have other, you know, I'm working on this project and I had another idea for a different project and I started swatching for it and was like, Oh, here's my little swatch actually. Um, it's like a little lace swatch. So I started swatching for it immediately and was like, let me just start this right now. And then I looked at my little spreadsheet and was like, girl, don't you need to literally be choosing testers to get your other pattern out to testers tomorrow? Like, oh yeah, duh. So I find it helpful for just like forcing me to remember the things that I like said I was gonna make a pattern for. Cause I will literally forget that they exist, especially if the top is like in a drawer or something. Okay, so who are some of your favorite knitwear designers? So in terms of people whose designs I have actually knitted myself, uh, I guess I think I've only knitted more than one pattern from two different designers. One is Lily Kate Makes. So I knitted the one that I want crop, the Tidy Tee, and the Ribblesdale Vest. So I thought that all three patterns were really well done. I think that she has a very like elevated look to a lot of her designs. I also think that she understands fit really well. Like you see a lot of other designers who are only ever making super baggy oversized things. And I think Lily Kate makes a lot of fitted garments, which takes a lot of skill and like knowledge of garment construction and fit in general. Um, so I think she's a really good eye for detail. I also think there's a lot of just like really nice finishing techniques that I specifically learned from her patterns. Like um, I learned short rows for the one that I want and I learned how to use them for cap sleeves in the tidy tee and I use cap sleeves all the time literally because of her pattern. Um, same thing with applied eye cord edging I learned in the Ribble Steel Vest and then I added it to like a billion things that I made last year. I mean, I'm even, I'm adding it to this top that I've been working on too. Another designer I have knitted a couple things from is My Favorite Things Knitwear. So I know that like, a, I think she's not very size inclusive. So take that with a grain of salt, but I do like the way that she writes her patterns. I knitted the sweater number 14 and I actually knitted the sweater number 16 twice. And I feel like the way she writes her patterns is very um, helpful for like giving you context. And I try to emulate that and how I write patterns now where she'll kind of tell you like, do this because it will like make the shoulder seem nicer. Or now you're going to start increasing into the neckline. Like it just kind of gives you context. Um, Cause I think that when you're a beginner and you're looking at patterns, you're like, okay, do X, Y, Z, but like, I don't, know how that connects to the big picture. So I think her patterns are really nice for like giving you sort of that big picture and also like little tips like that where you're like, oh, okay, I shouldn't do the cast, like I should pick up between the stitches or I should do X, Y, Z. So yeah, I find that really helpful. Um, she does mostly do oversized stuff. I'm not really into any of her tank top patterns, but I think her sweater patterns are nice. Um, so then another person whose designs I've actually never knitted, but I really like the aesthetic of all of her designs is another knit. I've actually shared a couple of her patterns on here before in some of my like styling videos. And um, yeah, I think I just really like her aesthetic. I think it aligns really well with my style. So while I haven't actually knitted any of them because um, she mostly started publishing patterns after I had a, sort of moved into like just freehanding or designing my own things. I am really into her stuff. I think it's really cute. What's your favorite creation? Ooh, that is a hard one. Um, I think that this sweater is one of my cre favorite creations for sure. I've already worn it several times since I made it. And I think I finished it in like February or March. Um, my Thine Own top, especially the first one I made in black and then also this new one that I made in white. I just really love that design. I think that was like a very, satisfying creative process for me of like seeing a vision. And, and I especially really love um, like adjustable clothing lately. I think that's like a really cool concept. So I felt really good about that design. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna say those two. I think I probably have like a recency bias um, in terms of just thinking about like the latest things I've made that I feel really good about. Um, <clears throat> oh, one kind of underdog I think is my uh, this t-shirt I made that I duplicate stitched a star onto. I have ended up wearing that so much more than I thought I would. I think it's really cute. I feel like every time I wear it, I feel like I'm like an Animal Crossing character or some kind of cartoon character and I'm wearing my like signature outfit. 
even though I wouldn't say that it's like exactly my personal style, um, but I just think it's really cute and like memorable, I guess. And I like that it's a little bit sloppy. I feel like that's like one of the more unpolished things that I've made, but it endears it to me more. Okay, what is the status of the Tide and True top pattern? Um, two people asked about this. Okay, so this pattern for anyone who like hasn't followed me for a while, I made three versions of it last year. I made a short puff sleeve version, a tank top, and also a long sleeve. And I really struggled with grading this design because it requires it to fit at a lot of very precise points on your body. And I wasn't really sure how to figure out like, you know, adjusting where does your bust fall? Like some people have higher busts, some people have lower busts. Um, so I really struggled with figuring out how to make that work for different people. I ended up writing it up as a made to measure pattern and I asked a tech editor to go over it with me. And then I got a little bit hung up on this, like we're basically trying to figure out the armhole shaping. I feel like for some reason, armhole shaping is honestly the, the hardest thing that I have dealt with in grading so far. Like. I don't know why, I just find that a little bit hard to figure out what the best approach is, especially for a made to measure pattern. So it kind of stalled out there for a little bit and I started working on other things that I was like more excited about. Um, like I worked on getting out the thine own pattern and also the um, prep school pullover pattern, but I really want to make this work. And someone messaged me um, saying that she really wanted to knit it and wear it on her wedding day, which like that would just be the most special thing ever. So that is a huge incentive for me to like get my shit together. So um, yeah, that's the status. I want to work on it this week. Okay. Hold me accountable. I need it. Um, but I love the tech editor that I've been working with. She's insanely helpful and um, very like patient and explains a lot of things. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back into that pattern. And I think I will break it out into a tank top in worsted weight cotton and then the long sleeve and puss sleeve in lace weight mohair or whatever other like lace or fingering weight fiber that you want. And yeah, those are my thoughts on it. Um, I really do want to get that one out. Okay, what is my most favorite yarn I've used and why? That is a really hard question. Um, I will say I really liked the Drops Cotton Merino yarn that I used. I was really surprised by it, but I think it just feels really nice in your hands. I look for, I feel like a lot of wool blends because wool gives you the stretch that you need for making like fitted clothing. And I feel like I kind of gravitate towards fitted clothing, but um, I don't always want to wear like thick wool in the summer. So having a cotton merino blend, I think is really helpful for that. And I just really like the way that this yarn feels. I think it feels really nice on your skin and it's not super expensive and it's also machine washable. So I just got this yarn on my trip to New York. It's by Sea change fibers, I'm pretty sure. And it is E. coli sport. It's a sport weight wool, like merino silk blend. I'm really into merino silk blends right now. I think it just gives a really nice, it just feels so good. It feels luxurious to knit with, but it's really expensive. So that is a downside. This was like a tourist visit splurge of like, you know, kind of buying a, almost like a souvenir from a trip from a yarn store that I can't go to locally. So that was how I justified it to myself, but I'm thinking about making that either into a tube top or into a cardigan. I'm kind of starting to lean towards cardigan, although I'll probably have to buy more yarn. So I don't know, but it's very expensive. But now I'm on the hunt for more um, like merino silk blends because I think that that's just something I really like. So what's a project you've wanted to start for a while but haven't gotten around to yet? Oh, I have this color work pullover sweater idea that I've had literally since I started knitting. And actually last year, I even I started making like color work fair isle totes for my, which became my summertime tote bag pattern, purely because I was like, I need to learn Intarsia and I need to learn Fair Isle to make this sweater. Like that is how, I don't know how much it has been in my head. Um, but it's like, would be very complicated. I started making the color charts last year and I like gave up for a little bit because they were just hard. And I think that would be like a really kind of tedious project, but I think I would feel so proud of it if I made it. So I don't know. I feel like I'm this year I've kind of been prioritizing making patterns for like a lot of the designs I have in my head. That one I think will probably be something I, I don't know that I would make a pattern for it. Um, I think it would just be like a personal fulfillment project. And yeah, maybe, I don't know when I'll do it. Maybe some winter when I'm just craving like heavy sweater that's like really involved and absorbing. I think maybe that is when I will prioritize working on it. But yeah, I 
I've had that floating around for a while. And then um, another cardigan, I've thought about making a like lace eyelet cardigan and I've just kind of been procrastinating on it because I feel like it might be a little bit annoying to grade. And I also think that um, like some of the shaping, how I normally like to do shoulder shaping with short rows and kind of like half sleeve shaping at the top of sleeves, I think would be kind of annoying to do in a, an eyelet pattern. And I just haven't felt like dealing with that. Um, I felt like it was the type of thing that I would, if I was just making it for myself, I would probably would have already made it, but I don't know. Sometimes I feel like guilty. This is so dumb, but sometimes I feel guilty when I make something that is just for myself that I know a lot of other people are going to ask for. And then I'm going to be like, yeah, I want to make a pattern for it. And then I feel like I'm like stringing people along if I don't prioritize figuring out those like annoying, less fun elements of making the pattern. So that's kind of sad that I'm admitting that, but that is why I haven't worked on that project. <laughs> so I don't know. I guess that's kind of silly. I mean, I feel like people would understand if I was just like, no, I'm not going to do a pattern for a long time, but yeah, I don't know. It just, I just feel guilty sometimes. <laughs> How to grade sizes for a pattern. That could be an entire YouTube series. I can't really get into all of it right now because I think grading has a lot of different elements to it, but to boil it down to its most essentials, you work off of a sizing chart and that has different measurements for different parts of your body for all the different sizes from like a 28 inch bust to a 62 inch bust. And you basically translate those um, size measurements of the body, you translate those to parts of your garment, and then you calculate how many stitches make up that width in inches. So you use your gauge for that. So you calculate like, okay, if my sweater needs to be this shoulder to shoulder measurement for every size, and that's this many inches, and I have this much ease, then this finished part of the sweater needs to be, let's say 15 inches then, which is so inaccurate, but whatever, let's say this part of the sweater needs to be 20 inches, then I need to figure out how many stitches that will be. Um, and then you do that for all the sizes. I use a spreadsheet for this. I think you, I mean, you can do it by hand, but spreadsheets will do the math for you. So you can just put in one cell and be like, okay, um, take this measurement and multiply it by this stitch per inch and then drag it across and do that for all of the different sizes. So that is like the bare bones of grading, but I find that there can be some complicated elements to it when you're trying to figure out like, okay, for, um, how often do I need to do an increase or a decrease for the underarms or for the shoulder or the bust, etc. And that might be a little bit different for every size. And so you have to like sometimes kind of finesse the numbers a little bit and everyone's body is different. So that can also make it complicated, but that is sort of the bare bones of how to grade. Um, if people are interested, I might be down to, I like the idea of making like a more in-depth video about how to grade, but honestly, I feel like there's still some elements of it that I'm not 100% confident about. So I might save that for later on in my knitting journey, because I feel like if I'm making a bunch of videos about it, it would probably take a while to like say everything I want to say. And I want to make sure that I'm saying it all right. And I'm not going to like look back on it in six months and be like, oh my God, I didn't know anything back then. Okay. Which needle size is good to start knitting? I do, I've done crochet for five years. Um, I mean, that's a personal preference, but if I had to say a needle size, I would say probably like somewhere between a US 8 and a US 11, which is like five millimeters to eight millimeters. This is a US 8, this is a US 11. Um, so for these, I would say like what I'm thinking about in terms of you being a beginner, um, I wouldn't recommend super, super big knitting needles because I think it can actually be a little bit harder to like get the motions right. and you might find that frustrating and you could like lose out on some of the, I don't know, muscle memory that you could be building. And also I personally don't like wearing very bulky things. And I think you want to be knitting things that you actually will love and enjoy. So I probably would stay away from like the bulky, ultra bulky sizes. You also, this is like a US two, this is very small and it will take a long time to make something. Um, and it can be a little bit harder to like, pick up your drop stitches and stuff if you're knitting very fine gauge. And you might also just get discouraged. Um, knitting in general, I've heard takes longer than crocheting. I'm not really a crocheter, but I would say those kind of weights, you could make a sweater that probably won't take you like a billion years, but also will be a sweater that you like to wear. So I would say somewhere in that range, but this is like totally subjective. Okay, how do you recommend leveling up your knitting? That's a great question. So I think the 
number one thing you can do to improve your knitting is learning how to fix your mistakes. And I think this is really important for several reasons. One is like, it will just improve the outcome of your knitting. Two, I think it gives you more confidence that you can try new skills if you know that you can like fix anything that you mess up. And then lastly, I think that really learning how to fix your mistakes actually like helps you understand your knitting better, like helps you even just understand the anatomy of like, like physically what is happening on your knitting needles. Um, and also will just save you time. Like if you unlock the ability for yourself to like ladder down and fix a mistake or, you know, fix your drop stitches or add an increase or a decrease where you forgot to add one, etc. I don't know. I think that it will just like help you understand the things that you are actually doing better. When I was first learning how to knit, I looked up so many tutorials. Like anytime a pattern had something that I didn't know, I would just immediately go to YouTube and look up a tutorial for it. I think that really helps you like learn techniques the proper way. Sometimes you might just like be going with what you think is right, but it might actually be affecting the outcome of your work. I also think that like some people kind of get into like a comfort zone with knitting and don't branch out of that where, you know, you go to a pattern and it has a different cast on or cast off technique. I know when I first started, I was like, what, what's the point? I already know one cast on or one cast off. Like why would I bother learning another one? Um, and then the, like, once you start to learn more, you realize, oh, different cast ons, cast off, different techniques have different attributes, I guess, in the finished work. Like some things are stretchier than others. Some things flare out, some things look different. Um, so I think the more patterns that you knit, and the more you actually like try to learn the techniques that are specific to that pattern, the broader your like toolkit will become, the broader your understanding of like what goes into a garment, the more like different construction techniques you'll learn. Um, like I mentioned with Lily Kate Makes, I learned a bunch of techniques from her patterns that I otherwise wouldn't have. So I think that if you're looking for how to get better, a lot of patterns on their like Ravelry or Etsy descriptions will list some of the techniques that you could learn. You could also use Ravelry search I don't know that everyone tags everything on the search, but like you can look up different techniques that you might wanna learn. I first started, I was very like deliberate about this, of, of making sure that projects that I worked on were like things that I wanted and would feel like, you know, proud of and happy to wear, et cetera, but also introduced me to some new technique that I didn't know before. Like whether that's like how to increase, how to decrease, how to do bust shaping, whatever it is. I definitely think that just like Broadly exploring, exploring lots of techniques and lots of different patterns will really help you improve. What is the weirdest place you've brought your knitting to? I feel so boring for saying this, but like maybe like knitting under the table on Zoom meetings, like when I would be interviewing candidates, uh, sometimes like a programming interview can take like three hours. And so they're like talking through all their code and I would just be like knitting under the table. Um, if you were my employer, you didn't hear that. What are you most excited to knit up this year? Ooh, that's a great question. Honestly, I feel like what I'm most excited to work on is almost always what I am actively working on in that moment. Like I'm very bad at delaying gratification and that is how I stay knitting all the time is that I'm just always like excited about the project that I'm working on. So yeah, if you ask me that question, it is like literally whatever, whatever is either my current project or my very next project. So um, this current project is going to be hopefully a, um, a V-neck tank top that closes in the front and I'm hoping that you can like kind of lace a ribbon or eye cord to tie the front in a bunch of different ways. So I'm really excited about that and I also want to make a cardigan version of it. That's what I'm thinking of. Maybe I'll use this sport weight yarn for. I really like the idea of designing a top that has some lace in it um, and that was what I was swatching for with this little guy and I also like the idea of making a sweater like a cable knit sweater this fall. Um, I think that would just be cute and satisfying. I don't really have many v-neck sweaters in my wardrobe beyond the ones that I've made and I've realized I really love wearing v-necks so I think I want to make a cabled v-neck would be really cute. How do you come up with your cutie designs? Well thank you. Um, I mentioned this already a little bit with some of the like inspiration but I feel like I'm just always keeping an eye out for stuff that I think is cute. I think that is basically just like where all of my inspiration comes from is seeing something and then the gears start turning and then I'm like, oh, I should like write this down because that would be really cool. I feel like some of the things I can't even remember how I thought of them. Um, for all of these like adjustable things, I had seen a TikTok of a vintage dress from the 90s that had like detachable parts to it. And that just got my brain like going down a rabbit hole of customizable adjustable clothing. So that's an example. It's not, it doesn't have to necessarily be a literal like, oh, I made this exact thing, but my version. Um, but like that can be something that you do too. The more that you like engage with that, I feel like the more you'll start 
seeing things and your brain will just start like going down these little rabbit holes of like, oh, that would be cool. Oh, but what if I did this? Do you have any other hobbies other than knitting? I do love to read and I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I generally try to read about two books a month. So I usually aim for like 24 a year. I especially love audiobooks because you can listen while knitting or like on walks or doing chores around the house. I like to play tennis. I'm really excited that the weather is starting to warm up again here because um, my boyfriend and I were playing a lot of tennis together the last couple summers. I'm not good or anything, but it's really fun. I mean, I love a good, it's like the only downside to knitting for me is like it's not active and it's very sedentary. So I um, love to have a hobby that like gets you moving and still puts you in that sort of like flow state. Um, so tennis was really fun. Plus, you can wear a little cute tennis skirt. I've kind of been meaning to knit like a cotton tennis sweater, maybe. I don't know. Um, I also like to dance. I'm, again, not a great dancer, but um, I just, I've been taking a ballet class, which has been really nice. Uh, I'm never going to be a ballerina. Don't have any of the like physical things that you need, but I just really like dance because it is like a good workout, but it has some creative expression to it. And also I feel like very present in my body for it. Like I used to do a lot of workout classes and I would basically just be like, okay, how do I turn my brain off until this thing is over? Like I'm not into endurance running or like, I don't know, spinning, etc. Not for me, but dance I feel like is the perfect workout for me. So that I also, um, back when I lived in San Francisco, I did a bunch of pole dancing classes, which were super fun and also very challenging. Um, I just signed up for another class here in Vermont. I kind of, I feel like my hobbies sort of took a hit um, during the pandemic. I was living in San Francisco. I also, I was rock climbing a ton when I lived out there, but um, during lockdown, like all the gyms closed, all the dance classes ended. And then I moved here to Vermont during lockdown. And so it took me kind of a while to like find my way back to those hobbies. So I do like the idea of picking up rock climbing again too, um, but I haven't yet. And then this is so lame. I literally sound like such an old person, but I love going for walks, especially because I live in a really beautiful kind of like countryside setting. Justice for walking. I feel like it's a really under underappreciated exercise. Do you have more classics or funky makes? Um, I definitely feel like I have more classics than funky things. I think generally my style, like my personal style, tends to lead towards like fairly classic things. You know, most of the things I've knitted are even just in like solid color yarn, so I feel like very classic in that sense. Um, I have tried to balance a little bit with, like I like the idea of making funky things, but I think that they're just not things that I would end up wearing, so then I would lose motivation for making it, um, if that makes sense. I think that I have, in the last six months, tried to balance a little bit more making things that are classic, but still feel special, which isn't really funky, but it's a little bit, um, I guess like there's some things that I feel like I make that you could just straight up buy in a store. Um, like my prep school pullover, it's just like a classic sweater. Um, but my thine own top and my tie and true, I feel like I kind of integrating like ribbons and other details, the customization, the, the like scoop back tank that I made, I feel like those are all feel very, aesthetically classic in a sense, but feel a little bit more special to me and a little bit more unique than just something that you could like buy at H&M, which like no shade, cause it's like lots, I feel like the majority of people wear classic stuff and it feels really good to make a staple that you wear all the time. So that is all the time that I have right now. As always, my camera is about to die and also overheat because I clearly just exhaust it. So thank you so much for asking these questions. If there are any questions that I didn't get to you uh, or any things that you're, you want me to talk about in the next sit and chat, ask them in the comments below. Um, and thank you so much for everyone who has been following along with me here so far. These videos are so fun for me to make and I love hanging out with you. So uh, subscribe if you aren't already. And I generally post videos every Friday and I'll see you next time.